Member for Bassendean. Uh, Madam Acting Speaker, can I seek an extension? <laughs> I'd actually like another 12 years. I've changed my mind. <laughs> um, I'm going to begin by thanking some people before I get onto one of my rants and lose all track of time. I, and the first person I have to thank, and the foremost person I have to thank, is my electoral officer of uh, 11 years, Linda Gordon, who now works for the member for Warnborough and is a truly remarkable individual, a truly remarkable human being who has extended uh, such generosity of spirit and competence to the people of Rileystone and the people of Bassendean. Uh, you made my job incredibly easy, Linda, and thank you for, for what you've done. Paul's very lucky to, uh, to have inherited you. Can I also thank um, my uh, second long-serving uh, electoral officer, uh, on again, off again, um, Dr Ann Jones, uh, an amazing woman, a remarkable researcher uh, with a great intellect, and both Linda and Ann have this amazing quality. They, they both which means that would preclude them from this place. They have massive ability and absolutely no ego. Um, so uh, incredible people, and uh, I thank them so much for their service. To my current staff, Patrick uh, has done a great job. Uh, Patrick's actually a tree hugger from the Greens. He's uh, sort of a temporary, uh, you know, temporarily on loan to us. Uh, a great man who has done marvellous work uh, in the, the two times that he served me. And thank you so much for your service. Uh, Steve's up there as well, an IT genius, and I thank you so much for your work, Steve, and to Lynn, who's not here today. Can I also thank my former staff members, uh, Simon, Bryn, uh, Genevieve, and even Frank. Oh, I think it's the night to forgive Frank, frankly. <laughs> so uh, even Frank. But can I thank all of those that have given me service over the years? Uh, and it's been, it's been a hell of a journey, and I thank you so much. Uh, I'll do the emotional bits first. I want to thank my family, and the first person I want to thank is my mother, who's up in the gallery. Up in the, uh, the uh, public gallery tonight. Um, Mum was the other half of the Rolly Stone team. Mum, we got a 12.1% swing between us, which was fairly substantial. I must say, Mum wasn't always the most overconfident of backers. When she rang, when I rang her at about half past seven on election night, when it was absolutely patently clear that Rolly Stone was one of the first seats in the bag, uh, Mum said, "Are you sure, Mart? Are you sure, Mart?" You know, there was absolutely no confidence expression. I think my mother was actually going to ring the uh, West Australian Electoral Commission and call for a recount. <laughs> um, but that was not unprecedented because when my TE results arrived back in 1976 and I did quite well in English, my mother has actually wanted me to ring the uh, Secondary Education Authority and see if they hadn't got it wrong, because perhaps they'd overmarked me. But Mum, you're a tremendous asset, and thank you for all you've done. Uh, to my sister Jenny, who's been a tremendous help and support, uh, I really su appreciate you. Even to my auntie Judy, who, as a member for Bateman would well know, whose sympathies lie on that side of the chamber, who's been, but has rolled out every election day to support me, I thank her for her efforts. To Melinda, Shane and Patrick, who aren't here tonight, they're actually in Dublin, and I will see them in Barcelona in, uh, next Sunday when I'm going to take a well-earned rest for a month on my expense. I might add Premier, so don't get excited <laughs> at my expense. I'm looking forward to seeing them. They are remarkable people. They are my rock. They have given me sanity uh, when sometimes this place has uh, seemed particularly insane. I want to thank those next within Labor who got me here and who kept me here, which was at times a very difficult task. Uh, during the 2001 pre-selection process, a pre-selection process which I won 132 to 130, so I just got to be the candidate for Rolly Stone. I want to thank Dean Summers, uh, who was a mentor at the time and was uh, a tremendous individual and a sad loss to West Australian Labor. Uh, I also want to thank the member for Coburn, who was a bit of a mentor for me at the time and helped support me. And I also want to thank for Alana McTiernan, who I think it's probably safe to say now ratted on the centre and voted for me and got me over the line. <laughs> I especially want to thank the coordinator of the centre, who actually, I don't know who it was, I can't remember, well actually I do, but I won't mention it because it's too embarrassing, who actually prepared a centre how to vote card in the pre-selection, and it had two candidates, Tom Hoyer for the centre candidate and Martin Whiteley, the left candidate, and prepared the how to vote card and it said, Tom Hoyer won, Martin Whiteley won. Uh, <laughs> now, that's bad enough, but eight members of the centre actually followed the ticket. <laughs> And I won by two votes, so you can see how improbable it was that I would have got here. Um, now, we won Rolly Stone with the uh, second biggest swing in the state, only exceeded by the member for Albany, who achieved a 15.8 per cent swing. And uh, what a tremendous ornament to the parliament he's been. And keep going. Long may you be here. Um, and it's true to say I didn't stop smiling for the first six months after I got elected. I was just so happy and so overjoyed. Um, and basically, it was, a, it was a wonderful time. I enjoyed that first 
six months in the first two years, uh, blissfully unaware of the future that lay ahead of me, uh, when savagely the West Australian Electoral Commission savaged my boundaries and cut Rolly Stone into five different pieces, so I completely disappeared on the 10th of May 2003. Um, now, I remember on that morning I was actually asked by, the, uh, by Alana McTiernan, and to, as the Minister for Planning and Infrastructure, to represent her at a meeting of 300 angry school bus contractors who were looking for contracts in perpetuity. <laughs> and the Libs, there were about five or six Libs and National Party members there, and they were promising them contracts in perpetuity, despite the fact that it couldn't be done under su state supply legislation. And these people, we'd promised them 20 or 25 year contracts, which seemed fairly generous. And these people were baying for blood. And I was the sole government representative in front of an angry mob of 300 school bus drivers just having had my electorate slashed that very morning. Talk about contracts in perpetuity. I wasn't feeling terribly sympathetic. I got up, gave them a mouthful, and, and I was actually that close to inviting all 300 of them outside into the car park to sort out our differences. Um, it's fair to say um, that from that moment on, I experienced that uh, old truth in politics, if you want a friend, buy a dog. Uh, because whilst I had brought something to the table for the Labor Party as the member for, for an unwinnable seat, uh, having won a, an unwinnable seat off the Libs, uh, I was uh, everybody's pal. Uh, suddenly I was another hungry, hungry mouth to feed and you know, one thing led to another. And I was somewhat shell-shocked. And I've got to actually thank two people, a number of people that actually did a great service to me in, in uh, prolonging my career, uh, Ruth Weber, Weber and Alastair Jones. I also have to thank Jeff Gallup, Mark Latham, because I knew his wife Janine when she, from when she was about uh, 10, and also Anthony Albanese, which might surprise a few people, all of whom had a hand in me surviving the 2005 pre-selection round. Um, the process was particularly difficult for me because I'd become non-factional at that stage, uh, uh, and um, I'd done that because my own faction at the time wanted me to knock off Paul Andrews, who happened to be my best mate in politics. And I said I hadn't done it, and uh, I wouldn't do it, and I didn't do it. And, and it took a few people, a few guys, to actually believe that that was going to be true. Ironically, in not doing it, I thought I'd ended my political career, but ironically, in not doing it, because the whole thing went to national pre-selection, Paul's mob were in charge, and I actually got looked after. So uh, if I had have done what I was told, I would have been a one-termer who tried to knock off his best mate, and that would have been my legacy in politics. So uh, it didn't seem like a very smart strategy at the time, but it seemed to have paid off. Maybe I was just ahead of the game. Um, Look, I, I really do want to thank Ruth Webber. Uh, Ruth, Ruth went to bat for me when others didn't, uh, and it cost Ruth. It cost Ruth big time. It cost her a second term in the Senate, and uh, I personally uh, will always be incredibly grateful to her. Um, 2008, the game had changed a little bit. I was not quite the babe in the woods. It was fair to say I sort of walked around dumbstruck in the 2005 pre-selection round, but by 2008 I'd learned a few political survival skills, and I was vulnerable for two reasons. I had refused to join a faction. And worse than that, I'd been a very active member of Labor Reform Forum. The uh, some would uh, accurately, I suppose, describe it as Alana's anti-faction Alana's anti faction, faction uh, along with the uh, member for uh, Pilbara. Uh, we had a, one thing about the uh, Labor Reform Forum. We had a lot of energy, a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of powerful arguments, but we were missing that magic ingredient, state executive votes. Uh, and asking those with power to use their, their votes to reduce their power is not always the uh, the most uh, sensible strategy or the most effective strategy. Um, during that 2008 pre-selection round, I had one very powerful ally, somebody I have to thank enormously for the, for the last four years, and that is the Premier Alan Carpenter. Alan backed me. Um, and in fact, Alan rang me on a Monday night and uh, he said, Martin, you know, I don't know why you're so unpopular, but everyone seems to be wanting to knock you off. And he said, you know, I said, well, what are you going to do, Premier? He said, well, I'm going to look after you. I think you're worth saving. So knowing how politics is, I thought, you beauty, I've got something in the bank here that needs to be traded on. So uh, I rolled up the parliament the next day. There'd been a break. There'd been about a, th a week sitting break, and I rolled up the parliament the next day. And uh, the media were camped out at all the entrances, and, and all the hub hub about who was going to be pre-selected and who was going to be rolled was starting to roll around. So I thought, well, I'm going to, I'll go to the, you know, I'll go in the south entrance, and uh, they'll ask me about uh, about my pre-selection, and I'll say, well, you know, the premier's backing me. You know, end of story. So I walked in the south entrance, and uh, the media were all camped out there, and they didn't ask me anything. So I thought, oh God, this isn't good enough. So I went down to my office and I stewed for a moment because I knew this was my best ammunition. Get it out there early, lock them away early before other deals get done. So I walked, walked back out the south entrance and I walked around to the north entrance and there was a media camp out there. And I walked through there and I was expecting to ask me, they didn't ask me. I thought, oh bugger this, I walked back into my, uh, 
into my parliamentary office and I thought, well, God, I've got to get this out there because if I don't do it today, you know, something will change and, you know, I'll be, I'll be history. So I walked out the north entrance and I walked around at the front entrance and Rebecca Carmody bowled, bowled me up and she said, oh, Martin, we've heard your priest lectures under th threat. I said, why would you think that, Rebecca? The Premier's back me? God, it's a done deal. I, you know, I couldn't understand why you think that. And that night the Premier was on telly backing me and it was all squared away. So I actually learned a few little survival instincts along the way. <laughs> 2012, the battle line started to draw, draw again and I could see some others on the other side were starting to salivate and a few early missiles were fired off in my direction and my heckles got up and I was starting to get punchy again and ready to go again. And I think by this stage I probably would have even been more, uh, a little harder to kill because I hope to think I've built a bit of a reputation for doing the odd thing. But one day I was just sitting quietly in my electoral office and it dawned on me that I didn't really want it and one of the reasons I was fighting was because they were trying to take it off me. So uh, I made the decision that... Uh, and it was a difficult choice, but it was my choice, and I'm absolutely certain it was the right choice. And I want to make it absolutely clear, so there's absolutely no ambiguity about this, I do endorse the candidate for Bass and Dean. Dave Kelly, I think, is a very capable individual. And I have had problems with Dave, and I've had problems with the amount of power that Dave holds within the power, and those problems remain, the uh, power that Dave holds within the party. I do think the, uh, the, the leaders of the major unions have far too much power in the party, and we need to dissolve that power amongst the hands of ordinary rank-and-file unionists and make our party more inclusive. But I have absolutely no, uh, uh, no problem with Dave Kelly's ability. I think he's a, uh, a hard worker and he'll be a great advocate for the people of Bass and then has, has been for the uh, members of United Voice. But I don't back away from uh, my calls for reform of Labor's rules to disperse power. Uh, I think powers, Labor has got to be the party of big ideas, not the party that you know, carves it all up because of state executive vaults. We have to protect that culture of competition and merit and uh, fight uh, the culture of cronyism and compliance. Now, my loyalty has been tested with the Labor Party and there have been moments when I've actually thought I've eyed the, uh, I've eyed the cross benches, but I've always come back to one basic principle and that is what good the Labor Party has done for others over a lo its long history and you also dance with the one that brung you and you guys brung me and that's why I've stayed. Um, next year I will be contesting pre Senate pre-selection for uh, for the, for the Labor Party. I intend to nominate. I'd love to win. I think I'd make a good, sen a good senator, but I don't expect to win, frankly. I expect to lose. But I am nominating so as to be a catalyst for change. There is a conventional pessimism amongst uh, uh, Labor that Joe Bullock has the numbers. Um, now, my problem with Dave Kelly was always been the power he had, not the person. Uh, I'm not going to go into things that I've discussed previously, but my problem with Joe Bullock is the power and the person. Um, the prevailing attitude is that Bullock has the numbers and nobody likes it, but nothing can be done about it. Well, I challenge Labor to do better. Um, now, if, if, if that proves to be true, if we can't do better than that, well, I'm afraid that's me. I'm shot with the Labor Party. Uh, I am offering myself for pre-selection, but I would be very happy, very happy if Labor picks a ticket that's based on merit and talent and ability. Uh, and, uh, you know, if that happens and it doesn't include me, I'm very happy to be the booth captain at Muck and Boudin at the uh, 2013 federal election. Uh, now, uh, I think that there are some great lessons that Labor can learn here from what's happened in New South Wales. Now, I think the problems that are endemic in New South Wales are far deeper than, than anything that I can touch upon here. But they did pre-select Bob Carr and look what it did to Labor's credibility. You can imagine if we had a Senate ticket headed up well, we had senators like uh, Senator Jeff Gallup or Senator Alana McTean and what it would do to the credibility of the West Australian Labor Party. Now, all of this is going to be resolved after March the 9th, which is something I requested, and I'm glad that the party, I'm sure that had the usual influence that my requests do, but uh, I'm glad that the party's actually headed that, that, headed that thing. So all will be, be resolved after March the, March the 9th. Um, so I'm really looking forward to supporting the great state Labor team that we have here. Uh, we do have a good leader in Mark McGowan, a great leader who I think can go on and become a great Premier. We have some real depth of experience, a real mix of experience and new talent. Uh, and I won't name people, but there's some excellent talent that's, uh, that's coming to the Parliament. And we've also got a very talented branch of pre-selection candidates. Uh, and I think there's some reasons that I won't go into as to why we actually managed to pick such a good crew. Uh, but uh, well done. And I, I look forward to their, uh, to, their, uh, to, their, uh, to their success in March. I especially want to wish luck to the class of 2001, uh, those that took a seat off a Conservative. Now, I was one of those. Now, my seat obviously disappeared in a pre-selection, uh, in a uh, redistribution row, but particularly the people like the member for Albany, 
the member for Collie, the member for Mandra, the member for Joondalup, the member for Mindari. Um,